Amen. John chapter 19, the first 16 verses. And the King James text today reads, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate, and, uh, Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speaketh thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, Listen carefully, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while this afternoon on the topic, No King But Caesar. Amen. No King But Caesar. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity to be in the house of the Lord, and we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for this marvelous document which gives to us an understanding which allows us, Lord, to come into revelation. Master, I believe today you have a prophetic word for your church. And I pray, God, that every ear would hear, not only those in this room, those watching right now, by reason of the internet, but the many, many, many who will watch uh, later, at later time, by reason of our many video and audio outreaches online. Master, open the ears today of those who have caused themselves to become deaf, who have closed their ears to truth, uh, God, because of carnality and worldly thinking. 
And help us today to be liberated by the word of God. For your word promises, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Anoint the speaker that I might deliver the word of God faithfully. Anoint the hearer that we might receive it not only in our hearing but in our hearts. Help us, O oh God, today to lead better saints, more committed to the cause of Christ than the commitment with which we came. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Happy to see James Spring with us as well online today. Amen. No king but Caesar. I want to begin this message by making it abundantly clear to you that this is not by any means designed or meant to be a political message, okay? I am, I am going to refer to our current political situation a little bit. But this is not about politics. There is a lesson in this for all of us, and we all need to hear this. Jesus Christ was brought before Pilate, Pontius Pilate, who was a representative of the Roman government in Palestine, in the Jewish territories. And he was placed in judgment before Pontius Pilate, and honestly, in the course of Pilate's interactions with Jesus, Pilate could find nothing wrong with the man. Pilate three times came out and told the Jews, I find no fault in him. I don't know what your problem is with him, but I don't see it. He said, furthermore, what do you want me to do with your king? Do you know what that tells you? For the Roman the Roman representative in Palestine to acknowledge Jesus as their king. Do you realize what was going on? Pilate was endorsing Jesus Christ as the king of the Jews. He was saying to them literally, hey, from what I've seen, this guy should be sitting on a throne in your country. This guy should be ruling your country. You should be listening to him. Hello now. You should be listening to this fella. What do you want me to do with your king? And all that just made the Jews even more and more upset. Why don't you know, Pilate, that this man has claimed to be the son of God? I've tried to tell you in the past that when a Jew uses the term son of God, they do not mean that you are the offspring of God, that you are the second person of the Holy Trinity. The Jews didn't know anything about any trinity. When they use the phrase Son of God, they literally mean that this man claims to be God in human form. Now, when he said to G when he when they said to Pilate, this man claims to be the Son of God, I want you to understand the Bible said Pilate went back into a judgment hall, sat down with Jesus, and began to talk to him again. You know why? Because Pilate understood good and well what that term meant. And what it meant to the Jews. In other words, he understood when the Jews said it what the Jews meant. How did Pilate know? Why did Pilate understand this term? Well, I'll tell you why. Pilate served a man in Rome who was a Caesar. Now we know that the first Caesar, uh, uh, Caesar Augustus was the first Roman emperor. He was the first Roman Caesar. He lived at the time of the Lord's coming into earthly existence. The first Caesar literally ruled in Rome at the time that Jesus came into the world. But he died and his adopted son, his adopted son, replaced him as the new Caesar. So when the Jews were telling Pilate these things concerning Christ, Tiberius Caesar, the second Caesar, the second Roman emperor, the stepson of Caesar Augustus, was sitting on the throne in Rome. Now let me explain something to you. Tiberius Caesar had declared himself to be the Son of God. 
You didn't know that, did you? If you don't know history, <laughs> then you might not know this. Tiberius Caesar was a very highly inflated egomaniac, and he literally declared himself to be the Son of God, meaning God in human form. That is why the Romans looked at their emperors as though they were gods. Are you following me? You've heard that before, haven't you? I'm not the first person to tell you they looked at their emperors as though they were gods. No. The first Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, he is the one who declared himself to be God. At first he declared himself to be God in human form. When Caesar died, they claimed that at that point he became a God in spiritual form. Jesus came and Jesus declared himself to be the Son of God and he said, All those that came before me, do you remember that? You remember him saying, All those that came before me, they're liars and they're thieves. Now, you see, a lot of us don't understand, but histor historically, there were men who had done exactly what Jesus was doing, declaring himself to be God in human form. So Jesus was saying, all those who have done this before me were liars. They were thieves. They were trying to rob me of who I am by declaring themselves to be a deity. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you today? Now, why is this important? Well, I'll tell you why it's important. Because when the Jews couldn't get Pilate to fulfill their wishes based on their law, they were upset that he declared himself to be the Son of God based on their law. That to them was a, uh, um, yeah it was, <laughs> That to them was a travesty. That was something that no man should do. No man should declare himself to be God. This man was committing an abomination. He was committing abomination by declaring himself to be God. And they wanted Pilate to punish him for their religious beliefs. Oh my goodness. Do we know anybody in our world today that has that mindset? Do we know any people in our world today who want the government to carry out their wishes on certain groups of people because of their religious beliefs? Uh -huh. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we know people like that, don't we? Yeah. They call themselves Christians. They claim they serve God. They claim they know who Jesus is. But somehow or another, instead of going to God about things, they're going to the government and trying to get the government to do their bidding and trying to get the government to do their wishes. That's exactly what they do. I'm going to tell you something, folks. The church today has walked in the footsteps of Israel every step of the way. If you look at the testimony of the Old Testament and you look at the environment of the New Testament, you will see that the Christian church throughout the centuries has literally imitated step by step every single thing Israel did throughout history. They've turned their back on the Lord. They've become murderous. They've become prideful. They've become uh, thieves. They've done all kinds of things that were against the law of God. And I've got news for you, the church today is no better. As a matter of fact, as the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ draws near, the church is looking more and more like the Jewish people at the Lord's first coming. Mm, that's a little scary if you think about it. There are a lot of people in the church today. If Jesus were to appear today on planet Earth, Johnny, they'd be crying, crucify him, crucify him. He's too liberal. We hate them liberals. How dare he say we're supposed to be good to those that come into our land who weren't born here? How dare he say we're supposed to be good to the sick? How dare he say we're supposed to care for the poor? Who is he to tell us that we're supposed to do all this? Am I telling the truth? I got news for you, folks. Jesus would be far too liberal for most Christians in the fundamentalist and evangelical circles anyway uh, today. And we have a whole group 
of Christians in America today who are turning to the government. They're trying to get the government, just like the Jews were trying to get Pilate, to fulfill their wishes based on their religious beliefs. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Well, that didn't work. And when that doesn't work, well, now we, we've got to change our tact a little bit. We got to do things a little different. We can't seem to get the government to do what we want it to do based on our religious beliefs. Now listen carefully. So we have to convince the government that our enemy is also their enemy. Aha. Now we have to convince Pilate that Jesus is not only our enemy, he's also an enemy of Caesar. He's also an enemy of Rome. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Oh my goodness, how many people in our community today have had to sit through uh, listening to liars and spin doctors get on television and try to convince the government and convince people in our nation that certain segments of our community are just trying while well, we're only there to tear down America. We're only there to destroy America. What does Mr. Trump do but get up on national television over and over and over and over again and tell the country that every person who comes to our border seeking refuge and seeking a better life, they're not good, honest, decent working people who are looking to better their lives. No, they're crooks, they're thieves, they're killers, they're murderers. Am I telling the truth? You see, you thought that tactic was something new, didn't you? You thought demonizing folks in order to turn people in mass against them was something new. No, no, no. It's been going on for eons. This has been going on for millennium. This is what the Jews of Jesus' day did. They turned to Pilate and they said, Pilate, you don't understand. Not only has he broken our law, but, but he claims to be a king. And if he claims to be a king, <laughs> I got news for you. Oh, Caesar doesn't like that. And in the Roman government, let me tell you something. Your position in Roman government was very precarious at best. You had to work overtime to stay in the good graces of that heady, high-minded uh, Caesar who sat in Rome. And Pilate knew that his position was not guaranteed. It wasn't guaranteed he'd always be there. It wasn't guaranteed he'd always have that job. No, there were two things he needed to do to keep his job. He had to keep the Jewish people calm and keep them quelled because if there was an uprising, that would upset Caesar. And he had to keep Caesar happy. Hmm. That's a tough position to be in, isn't it? I, I, he, he, everything he did, he had an audience of one. Have you watched the news lately? And have you ever watched some of the people working in our government? And have you ever heard newscasters say they've got an audience of one? Meaning, there's, everything comes off their lips. They're just trying to make the guy at the top happy. They don't care if it's the truth or if it's a lie. They don't care if it's factual or if it's fiction. They're saying every word they're saying just to keep the guy at the top happy. Why? Because if the guy at the top ain't happy with me, I lose my job. Am I telling the truth? So this is the situation that Pilate found himself in. And it was a tough situation because on one hand, he's trying to keep the Jews calm. And on the other hand, he's got to keep Caesar happy. Now the Jews are claiming, oh, wait a minute, this guy's an enemy of Caesar as well. This guy's an enemy of the government as well. He's made himself a king. And you know what Pilate does? Pilate talks to the Lord a little bit. He comes back out. He said, hey, guys, you know what my opinion is? Behold your king. He said, this guy can be your king. He's no threat to Caesar whatsoever. I got news for you. A lot of countries, a lot of places that Rome has conquered had a king. 
They're, they no longer have any authority. They no longer have any power. But they're still their king. So we don't have any problem with him being the Jews' king. Doesn't bother us no way. Politically, that's not a problem. Do you follow what I'm saying? Oh, now the Jews get really upset. Well, we tried first. We tried to get this fool to, to uh, carry out our laws for us on our behalf. And he wouldn't do that based on our religious beliefs. Then we tried to convince him that this guy was an enemy of Caesar. And he wouldn't buy that. He was willing to say, well, hey, if you've got a king, it's no sweat off my brow. You're a little tiny country. You don't amount to a hill of ease. Your king would have no power or any authority, no matter how you slice it. But you know what's interesting? When Pilate brought the Lord back into the judgment hall, and he sat down and was trying to have a conversation with him. In verse 13, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement. But in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. So, well, now y'all failed. You tried to get me to do your bidding based on your religious beliefs, and I wouldn't do that. You tried to convince me this guy was a threat to Caesar, that he was a threat to the Roman Empire uh, by being your king, and I've got news for you, I don't buy that. So, as a matter of fact, if I've ever seen a man who's any more qualified to be a king, it's this guy. He's never tried to stir up a political uprising. He's never gotten into the realms of polity. i got news for you today, folks. The church should never be trying to stir up political uprising. The church should never be trying to get into the politics of the world and manipulate it for their purposes. Said so this guy should be your king. This is a guy I could work with. He doesn't create any problems for us politically. He comes out and said, Behold your king in verse 14. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Do you see how Pilate keeps emphasizing the fact that Jesus is their king? Pilate, the Roman governor, keeps saying to them over and over again, Hey, as far as I'm concerned, this guy looks like a king to me. He looks like a king from where I sit. How many of us watched? If I could, uh, Nelson Mandela. When, when Nelson Mandela was finally freed from the prisons in uh, South Africa, if you remember when that happened, and there was such adulation and people were so excited and happy and I would see Nelson Mandela interviewed on television and that man had the most humble the most peaceful spirit I've ever seen in a human being in my life I'm sitting there and I'm thinking Lord have mercy if I had spent as many years in the jail cell as he had said if I'd have been mistreated the way he'd been, I'd have come out of that prison probably, God forgive me, ready to kill somebody. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I'd have been mad as a hornet. I'd have been carrying on like some kind of a lunatic. Here he comes out of jail. And as he's leaving the jail, he says, I, I hold no ill will toward my captors. Immediately, it didn't take a genius to be able to look at Nelson Mandela and say, hey, there's a guy with a future. There's a guy who could be president of South Africa one day. Do you understand what I'm telling you? You could tell by, by the way he carried himself. You could tell by his humility and his self-control and his temperament that this man was worthy of being a great leader. Well, that is what Pilate was doing. He was looking at Jesus and listening to Jesus. And with everything the Jews were doing to him, he wasn't screaming and hollering. He wasn't accusing them of stuff. He wasn't fighting. The Bible said as a lamb lit before the shears, he just came before the slaughter. He came and opened not his mouth. He didn't say a word. And Pilate's looking at him. He said, this guy could be their king. I don't know why they don't make this man their king. He's got incredible patience. He's got incredible self-control. He's He's got incredible amounts of compassion. You can see the love in his eyes. 
comes out and says, Behold your king, yet again. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Mm. There's the problem right there. There's the problem right there because now what the Jews have done is they have taken this issue. Remember, there are two parties that they're supposed to be keep, that uh, Pilate's supposed to be keeping calm and working with, right? He's got to keep the Jews happy and he's got to keep Caesar happy. Well, now the Jews are pledging their allegiance to Caesar alone. They've entirely abandoned their religion. They've entirely abandoned their... This issue no longer has anything to do with their faith at all. It has to do strictly with politics. We are devoted to Caesar alone. No king but Caesar. And all of a sudden that changed the game. Because now his reaction was going to hit Caesar's ears. And depending on how he reacted at this point... It would cost him his job or potentially cost him his life. The Bible said at that point he turned the Lord over to be crucified. All about politics. I'm here to tell you today, folks, there are many in the church today who are declaring we have no king but Caesar. There are many in the church church today who have become so conflated and so out of their mind with their religion. They've tried to manipulate government to do what they wanted government to do based on their religious convictions, and that didn't work. So then they tried to convince government that the, the, those they opposed were also enemies of the state. They were enemies of the country. They were enemy, enemies of our government. And that didn't seem to work. So all of a sudden now, they have to make an allegiance that is strictly and entirely to a man. they got to push God out of the equation entirely. Mm -hmm. Now we've got 80-something percent of the evangelical and the uh, 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 fundamentalist community who are pledging their undying allegiance to who? But to Donald Trump. Wait a minute, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? See, you started out claiming you were representing Jesus when you tried to turn the government against people based on your religious convictions, which were supposed to be based in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Then you tried to get the government to make these people enemies from a political standpoint, and that didn't work. So now what do you have to do? Well, now what it boils down to is, and this is what it boiled down to the Jews in Jesus' day, God isn't doing it, so we're going to get it done. God hasn't silenced this man, Jesus, so we're going to silence him. And if it takes our abandoning our God, oh my Lord, if it takes us abandoning our faith and pledging our allegiance to a man to get our will done, then by God we'll do that. And we have churches this afternoon that have led out of their services and all morning long a preacher got in the pulpit and preached Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. That's all they heard was how God appointed this man, how God put this man in position so that he could do all these great and wonderful things on behalf of the church. And just like the Jews of Jesus' day, they don't even recognize that they're working against God. And they're doing it in God's name. Mm -hmm. Say, Pastor, I appreciate what you're saying. I recognize it. I see it happening in the church world. But how does this have anything to do with me? We must be careful. I'm going to say some things that I know are going to make enemies online. I know people are going to get upset with me. That's well and dandy. I make a lot of enemies when I try to tell the truth and people don't like it. So, well, I'm going to say it anyway. I've said it before. So this isn't the first time a lot of you will have heard me say this. Folks, i got news for you. 
If you think this cult mentality that we're experiencing in our political environment today, if you think this is the first time we've seen this in American politics, then you were asleep during the Obama years. I'm just going to say it. Part of the problem we have, part of the reason the right has gone as far right as they've gone is because the left went as far left as it went. And what happens is when a pendulum swings way off to the left, guess what? When it comes back down, it's going to swing way off to the right. It's going to go the equal distance in the opposite direction. There were too many people who worshipped Obama. I'm just saying it. There are still people who worship Obama. There are still people who, every time you look online, every time you read something on Facebook, Oh, Obama, come back and save us. Uh, no, we don't need Obama to come back and save us. What we need is a sane president who's able to do the job. And honey, there are many people out there who could do that. It doesn't have to be Obama. Presidents are allowed to serve two terms. Why in the world are there people out there who are so Obama nuts that they act like the only way in the world that our, our country can be saved is if Obama comes back? Do you follow what I'm saying? I'm talking about there is that same excessive, overboard, almost cult-like mentality. I did not, I, I know I'm going to make a lot of people mad at me, but as I've said, oh well, so be it. I didn't like Obama when he first ran. Had nothing in the world to do with him being black. I was all for us having our first black president. I had no problem with a black president. Matter of fact, when he got elected, even though I, there were things about him I wasn't crazy about, I cried because I thought it was wonderful that we had a first black president. I really did. I thought that was a wonderful thing. So him being black wasn't the issue. But my issue was the way that he was marketed during his campaign. He was marketed like a messiah. He was marketed, if you remember, that you said these pictures of him and underneath it it said, Hope! Obama is our hope! No, Jesus is our hope. Obama may be the right man for the right time, for the right job. You know, I, I accept that argument, if you follow what I'm saying. But I don't follow the argument that he's our hope. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Now, somebody out there is, oh, preacher, you're just putting too much into this. You know, that was just trying to say, well, you know what? I'm sorry. I believe in humility. I believe leaders should have humility. I believe leaders should carry themselves with humility. If there's anything in the world you can say about J uh, Jimmy Carter, you may dislike him politically, but there ain't nobody on this planet going to say he's a proud man or he's an egotistical man. No, he's a humble man. He's a good man. He's a decent. Do you follow what I'm saying? And when I saw the... When I saw the, the campaign that, that was being run, Obama's campaign, honestly, Bill, it made me very nervous. I said, well, I don't like this. I, I don't like the way they're representing him. I think it's dangerous. Guess what? We're paying the price now. Because people on the right turned around, and the minute they had the ability by hook or by crook, whether it was legal or illegal, the minute they could get back in power and they could push things to the limit as far as they could push it, they were going to do it. And now they're worshiping Trump the same way many people worshiped Obama. I'm just saying it. And you can hate me all you want to. Now... I will say this, and I told you, I'm not trying to preach politics. This isn't about politics, but I'm trying to make a, a deeper point. I felt like Obama did a very fine job. I really did. I didn't. <laughs> the, the whole time he was in office, all these people running around saying, Oh, we suffered under Obama. We, I didn't suffer under Obama. Did you suffer under Obama? 
Did you lose your house? Did you lose your car? Did you? No, I didn't. I didn't experience all these things. I don't know what they're talking about. To be honest, I don't know what they're. I think they're talking out of their hat. To be perfectly honest, I think the man did a fine job, and when he ran for re-election, I voted for him. All right, because I believe in. Being fair, I believe in being e e uh, open-minded. I believe in, you know, giving people their due. But see, I happen to look at things a little bit different than a lot of people look at things. I look at things, and if I learned anything from my dear old grandmother, bless her heart, <laughs> she used to drive me crazy because you'd come to her and start talking about something, and every single time, Bill, every time, she would play the devil's advocate. Every time. Didn't matter what you were talking about. She'd always come at it from the other guy's perspective. Well, but what if he's trying to say, or what if they really mean, or what if this, or what if that, you know? And she would make you think about whatever you were talking about from the other perspective. And oh, I hated her for it. <laughs> she used to drive me up. I'd say, oh, for crying out loud, Grandma! Every time somebody comes to you and says them, instead of her jumping on the bandwagon and saying, oh yeah, you're right, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, she never, not one time did she ever do that. She'd always approach from the other guy's perspective. But you know what she did? She forced me to look at things from the other guy's perspective. I'm going to tell you something. I thank God for that skill today. I thank God for that skill today. Because, Johnny, I can talk with people who believe entirely different than I do. I can talk to people who have ideas that are completely contrary to mine. And even if I don't agree, I'm not saying I agree with them, but I can understand their perspective. If they have a fear about something, I may not have that same fear. I may not understand why they fear that, but I can understand their fear. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. So, I said all that to say, we've seen this political extremism, we've seen this almost worship of political figures, we've seen this deification and this mindset of a political figure being a messiah, we've seen it long before we got to Trump. In all honesty, if you are old enough to remember, I'm not, for those of you that wonder, but I know many people who are. If you were old enough to remember a man by the name of FDR, mm -hmm. there were many people in America who looked at FDR as though he was the Messiah. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> they looked at FDR. He saved our country. He saved our... We were on the brink of disaster, World War II and the Great Depression, and you know, and he did. I mean, the man did an awful lot, but nobody's taken that away from him. But there are some people who almost went to the extreme of worshiping the man like he was a messiah. Oh, FDR, you know, he saved us. He did. So, no, this is not something brand new, but no matter when it happens or who it happens with, it is dangerous. Are you hearing me today? Yes. I don't care if the guy in the White House is as liberal as liberal they come. You do not worship the man in the White House. You always keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. I tried to tell people when George W. Bush was in his second term, I tried to tell people in the LGBT community, they'd get on Facebook, oh, he's against gay marriage. He's against this. He's against that. And, and people who don't understand how... American law and how politics work and how, how our Constitution works. They'll get so worked up over stuff that they don't need to be worked up over. And I had more people cramming about George W. Bush's position on issues related to LGBT, you know. And I get on Facebook say, people, what are y'all worried about? Why in the world do you care? I got news for you. Let me tell you a little secret about how this works. George W. Bush, can, he could hate gay people. He could, he could have all the negative views he wanted to have. And I said, gay marriage is still coming. 
It's still going to happen. It's going to happen in the court system. It's not going to happen on Capitol Hill. And George W. Bush won't be able to do a single thing in the world about it. How did it happen, Johnny? Just that way. Exactly that way. But I couldn't get people to listen. I had people who unfriended me. Oh, bless God, if you don't think that, 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 that he is an enemy of LGBT people in the York, he's going to prevent us from us. And he's not going to prevent us from nothing. Because I know how our government runs. I know how the Constitution designed our government to operate. One of the reasons the right is trying so hard right now to pack the courts with these right-wing nutjob judges is because they know exactly what I'm saying now. That a lot of things get decided in the courts, Johnny, that won't ever hit Capitol Hill. So it don't matter what president winds up getting elected, we could have the most liberal president in the world, and because they're packing the courts with all these conservatives, do you follow what I'm saying? It's going to create problems for years to come. And they know this. But we got people in our country who are always looking for a man. They're always looking for that one leader to be the Messiah, to be the answer to all our problems. That's why we got so many, I'm, I'm going to make more enemies now, Bernie worshipers. Oh my God. You got people out there, they act like there ain't a person in the world that could be president who would do a good job except for Bernie. And those same fools will cause us to have to sit through four more years of, of uh, Trump. Because if Bernie doesn't get the Democrat nominated, I'm not voting for any Democrat. That's what they did the first time, and that's why we're going through hell and high water right now. But they're going to worship their leader. He's the only one who can do the job. He's the only one who believes what I believe. He's the only one. Mm -hmm. No. Folks, I'm here to tell you today, you've got to get out of that mindset. The one I trust and believe in is God. The one I pray to is God. The one that I believe is able to make changes in our world that need to be made is God. I do not claim any king but him. He is my king. Caesar is just a political figure in this temporary carnal world. But I refuse to declare I have no king but Caesar. I refuse to put my trust and my confidence in a man. Let me tell you a little bit about Caesar real quick. The Caesar who was sitting at the top of the Roman Empire at the time of Jesus trial and crucifixion was Tiberius Caesar. In full, he was known as Tiberius Caesar Augustus or Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus. His original name was Tiberius Claudius Nero. He was born November 16th, 42, before the Common Era, 42 years before Christ. He died March 16th, just yesterday was the anniversary of his death. 37 common era. So 37 years. So he died roughly four or five years after the Lord ascended. Okay? He was the second Roman emperor. He reigned from 14 to 37 common era. All right. So he reigned from the Lord being roughly 14 years old until about four or five years after the Lord ascended. He was the adopted son of Augustus, whose imperial institutions and imperial boundaries he sought to preserve. In his last years, he became a tyrannical recluse, inflicting a reign of terror against the major personages of Rome. That includes the governors, that include the senators, that included everybody. So that would include Pilate and people who served in positions like Pilate. But listen to what the Word of God had to say to the Jewish people concerning the Lord in Psalm chapter 5 and verse 2. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. In Psalm 10 and verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished 
out of his land. Psalm 24 and verse 10. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Psalm 29 verse 10. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. Isaiah 6 and 5, then said I, Isaiah, when he had a vision of the Lord in the year that King Uzziah died, uh, this is what Isaiah said upon seeing the Lord on his throne. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In Isaiah 43, verse 15, God is speaking, and he says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. And yet, when it was convenient, the Jews who were taught and who believed that God alone was their King, suddenly were crying out, we have no king but Caesar. Do you know what they did? They committed abomination in an effort to fight what they perceived as an abomination. Got news for you folks. There are a lot of people in Christian churches today who are committing abomination as they are trying to fight what they perceive as an abomination. They're calling for murder. They're calling for war. They're calling for bloodshed. These are all things that ought never even cross the mind, never mind the lips of God's people. Oh, we ought to kill queers! Hello now. They're committing abomination. When the sons of thunder came to Jesus and said, Shall we call down lightning from the sky to destroy that city that would not extend a hospitable hand to us? The Lord turned to them and said, What spirit are ye of? What spirit are you operating under? Because it ain't God. God's spirit don't talk like that. God's spirit don't think like that. He said, I've come to save men's lives not to destroy them. And yet we've got people in the church today who have that same spirit. If they had the ability, they would call down lightning from heaven to destroy entire groups of human population. Am I telling the truth? They're committing abomination by devoting their energy, devoting themselves to a man, and they are leaving God behind. Because it's now become more important that they get done what they want done than who's doing it. Because i got news for you. What you think God wants done a lot of times isn't what God wants done at all. When John and... Uh, James and John came to the Lord and said, shall we call down lightning, you know, to destroy that city? Do you think for one minute they were expecting the Lord to rebuke them? No. They thought the Lord was going to say, yeah, man, that's what we ought to do. Right? You don't run to somebody and say, hey, shall we, shall we, here's what we should do, unless you're pretty convinced they're going to go along with it. But they found out, the Lord said, oh, no, 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 whatever, whatever spirit you're operating under, it's not God. I've got news for you today. There are a lot of people in the church who have declared no king but Caesar. All of their energies, all of their devotion today is now focused on a human being rather than on God. And all that they have done, all this Satan has brought them into this line of reasoning and this line of thinking so that they would commit abomination while in the process of fighting what they perceive as abomination. Can you imagine? Yeah. Can you imagine? You're fighting something that you think is abominable, and you're doing abominable things in order to fight it. I mean, it, what, a, what a thing, right? The Word of God tells us today, in Romans 8, 5 through 9, trying to keep on time today, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life 
and peace. I'm going to tell you, I don't know one single fan of Fox News today that I could honestly say has a peaceful spirit. No. Everybody I know that just adores Fox News, they're always worked up. They're always angry. They're always upset. They're always flustered. Because after all, that's all Fox News does is tell you how everything's going to hell in a handbasket and how, you know, the world's falling apart and how these people are to blame and those people are to blame. There's one lady online, um, she actually did a, uh, yes, she did. She actually made a film about her father, who had begun to watch Fox News. She said, my father was always a loving man. He was always a calm man. He was always a very controlled man. She said, all of a sudden, in his older years, he began to focus on Fox News all the time. She said, after a little while, he became angry all the time. He was always upset. He was always frustrated. He was, she said, we didn't even recognize him. She said, finally, after years of going through this with my dad, she said, my mother and I devised the plan that we would secretly wean him off of Fox. And we would secretly get him watching like other news stations and other TV, you know. She said, we did that. And over the course of a year or so, we totally got him away from Fox News. She said, you know what happened? He went right back to his old personality. See, you can't have people on television constantly preaching fear and preaching hate and preaching all this negativity and expect to have peace and, and calmness in your spirit. No, you're always going to be worked up. You're always going to be expecting the worst. And the Bible said, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I don't do things that contribute to me being worked up. I don't do things that contribute to me being upset. I follow peace. Because the carnal mind is the enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the spirit, excuse me, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're declaring today no, God, uh, no king but Caesar, honey, you're in the flesh. And in the flesh, there is no way in the universe you can please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Ephesians 6 and 12 tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. How many mistakes have Christians in America today made because they thought their enemy was people? They're now supporting one of the most wicked, ungodly men that's ever, 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 ever run for office in this country. And they're doing it. Why? Because they're carnally minded. Because they think that they need a man to make things what it ought to be. That God isn't working fast enough. God isn't doing what we want God to do. The changes that we think should be happening aren't happening. Um, did you ever think for a minute that might be because God didn't want it changed? Did you ever think for a minute that maybe what you perceive as the will of God is not the will of God? Did it ever dawn on you for one second that when Obama was president that that was as much the will of God as what you claim the will of God is today? Hello now. Because listen, you can't claim it for one and not claim it for the other. You can't stand there and say, oh, God appoints leaders. God's the one who puts people in positions of power. Well, if that's true, then it was as true for Obama as it is for Trump. Am I telling the truth? Our enemy today is not people. Our enemies today, folks in this church, our enemies are not people. We, we don't, it, our enemy is not the right. Our enemy is not Republicans. Our enemy is not fundamentalists and evangelicals. Our enemy is the spirit that is motivating these people to act the way they're acting. But if we're going to fight the enemy, 
we've got to fight the right enemy, number one, and we've got to fight with the right weapons. You cannot fight a spiritual enemy with carnal weapons. You've got to fight a spiritual enemy with spiritual weapons. This is why I say it's imperative today that we keep our eyes on Jesus and that we not for one minute allow ourselves to become convinced that any man or woman is the answer to our problem. No, God is the answer to our problem. If we will turn to God, if we will seek His direction, if we will seek His counsel, if we will seek His wisdom, He'll help us to uh, accomplish His will. Am I telling the truth today? I'm trying to hurry up and finish. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We're not fighting a flesh enemy. And if we're not fighting a flesh enemy, then we're foolish if we're trying to use fleshly weapons. Hello now. Amen. No, we have weapons available to us, but they're spiritual in nature, and the Word of God promises they are mighty through God. Hallelujah. Right. There is no enemy that faces us today. There is no enemy today that is fighting against compassion. There is no enemy today that is fighting against justice. There is no enemy today that is fighting against judgment. There is no enemy today that is fighting against equity in our country and in our world that cannot be fought through God. You don't fight it with picket signs. You don't fight it with guns. You don't fight it with carnal weapons. No. But if God's church would turn to God, things could happen. If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Oh, we've got so many in the church today who are doing things in wicked ways. And if only they would turn back to God and understand we're not fighting a carnal enemy and you need to stop fighting a carnal war with carnal weapons. If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. That's what God has promised. Lastly, this afternoon, 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. Thou therefore, Paul writes, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Bill, when you were in the army... And you were up there in uh, uh, Arcan uh, Arkansas, yeah, uh, uh, Alaska. I won't get it out of my mouth yet. When you were up there in Alaska, you weren't on the phone every five minutes with mom, hearing about all their family drama. You weren't always hearing. You weren't on in front of the TV watching all the political foolishness that was going on in the country. No, you didn't get entangled in all these things because you can't do your job well if you're caught up in all this other, am I telling the truth? That's what Paul said to Timothy. He said, you need to endure hardness as a good soldier. He said, and a good soldier doesn't get distracted. A good soldier doesn't allow himself to get caught up in all this other foolishness because he's trying to be a good soldier. He's trying to please the one who's called him to be a soldier. God has called us to be in his army. He wants us to fight a spiritual battle with spiritual weapons and most of our fighting ought to be done on our knees, not out in front of abortion clinics, not out in front of gay pride parades. He wants us to fight a spiritual war with spiritual weapons. He does not want us to become distracted. He doesn't want us to become enthralled with the things of this world. 
Because the more time we devote to all this trash, guess what we are failing to do? The things we ought to be doing. Amen? Oh, I want to tell you today, no king but Caesar? No, that may be what the Jews of Jesus cried out. That's not what this preacher is going to do.